the mask of death. Short time as he had to wait, James was unable to control his impatience. At last he arose, and completely sobered by the recent strange events, descended the steps of the platform and walked on without assistance. Let the yeoman of the guard keep back the crowd, he said to an officer, and let none follow me but Sir Ralph Ashton, Master Nicholas Ashton, and Master Roger Norwell. When I call, let the prisoners be brought forward. Your Majesty shall be obeyed, replied the baronet, giving the necessary direction. James then moved slowly forward in the direction of the pavilion, and as he went called Nicholas Ashton to him. What was that officer? He asked. Your pardon, my liege, but I cannot answer the question, replied Nicholas. And why not, sir? demanded the monarch sharply. For reasons I will hereafter render to your majesty, and which I am persuaded you will find satisfactory, rejoined the squire. Well, well, I dare say you are right, said the king. But do you think he will keep his word? I am sure of it, returned Nicholas. The time is come, then exclaimed James impatiently, and looking up at the pavilion, the time is home, echoed a sepulchral voice. Did you see, inquired the monarch? No, sire, replied Nicholas, but someone seemed to give you intimation that all is ready. Will it please you to go on? Enter, cried the voice. What speaks, demanded the king, and as no answer was returned, he continued, I will not set foot in the structure. It may be a snare of Satan. At this moment, the shutters of the windows flew open, showing that the pavilion was lighted by many tapers within, while Solemn strains of music issued from it. Enter, repeated the voice. Have no fear, sire, said Nicholas. That cannot be the war of the demon, cried James. He does not delight in holy hymns and the sweet music. That is a solemn diurge for the dead, observed Nicholas, as melodious voices mingled with music. Well, well, I will go on at a hazard, said James. The doors flew open as the king and his attendants approached, and as soon as they passed through them, the valves swung back to their places. A strange, sad settle met their gaze in the midst of the chamber stood a fire, covered with a velvet hall, and on it the bodies of a youth and maiden were deposited. Pale and beautiful were they as sculptured marble, and the smiles sat on their features. Side by side they were lying, with their arms enfolded, as if they had died in each other's embrace. A wreath of yew and cypress was placed over their heads, and flowers were scattered round them. They were Richard and Alison. It was a deeply touching sight, and for some time none saw. The solemn diurge continued, interrupted only by the civil sobs of the listeners. Both gone, exclaimed Nicholas, in accents broken, by emotion, and so young, so good, so beautiful, alas, alas, she could not have bewitched him, said the king. Alison was all purity and goodness, cried Nicholas, and is now numbered with the angel. The guilty one is in thy hands, O king, said the voice. It is for thee to punish, and I will not hold my hand, said James. The devices shall assuredly perish. When I go from this chamber, I will have them conveyed under a strong escort to Lancaster Castle. They shall die by the hands of the common executioner. My mission, then, is complete, replied the voice. I can rest in peace. Who art thou? demanded the king. One who sinned deeply, but is now pardoned, replied the voice. The king was for a moment lost in reflection, and then turned to part at this moment a kneeling figure, whom no one had hitherto noticed, arose from behind the dyer. It was a lady, robed in mourning, so ghastly pale were her features, and so skeleton like her attenuated frame, that James thought he beheld a spectre and recoiled in terror. The figure advanced slowly towards him. Who and what art thou in heaven's name? he exclaimed. I am Alice Nutter, sire, replied the lady, prostrating herself before him. Alice Nutter, the witch, cried the king. Why, I, I recollect thou wert here. I sent for thee, but recent terrible events had thee clean out of my head. But expect no grace from me, woman. I will show thee none. I ask none, sire, replied the penitent. I came to place myself in your hands, that justice may be done upon me. Ha! exclaimed James. Dost thou indeed pen thee of thy iniquities? Dost thou abjure the devil and all his works? I do, replied the lady, reverently. My compact with the evil one has been brought by the prayers of my poor daughter, who sacrificed herself on me, and thereby saved my soul alive. But human justice requires an expiration, and I am anxious to make it. Arise, ill-fated woman, said the king, much moved. You must go to Lancaster, but in consideration of your penitence, no indignity shall be shown you. You must be strictly guarded, but you shall not be taken with other prisoners. I humbly thank your majesty, replied the lady. May I take a last farewell of my child? Do so, replied James. Alice Nutter then approached the fire, and after gazing for a moment, and with deepest fondness upon the features of her daughter, imprinted a kiss upon her marble brow. In doing this, her tears fell fast. You can weep, I see, observed the king. You are a witch no longer. I, heaven be praised, I can weep, she replied, and so ease my overburdened heart. Oh, sire, none but those who have experienced it can tell the agony of being denied this relief of nature. Farewell forever, my blessed child, she exclaimed, kissing her brow again. And you, too, who her beloved Nicholas Ashton, it was her wish to be buried in the same grave with Richard. You will see it, done, Nicholas. I will, I will, 
by the squire in a voice of deepest emotion. And I likewise promise it, said Sir Ralph Ashton. They shall rest together in Wally Churchyard. It is well that Sir Richard and Dorothy are gone, he observed Nicholas. It is indeed, said the squire, or we would have had another funeral to call. Pray heaven it be not so now. Have you any other request to her? demanded the king. None whatever, sire, replied the lady, except that I wish to make full restitution of all the land I have robbed him of to Master Roger Norwell, and as some compensation I would fain add certain lands adjoining which have been conveyed over to Sir Ralph and Nicholas Ashton, only annexing condition that a small sum annually be given in dole for the poor of the parish that I may be remembered in their prayers. We will see it done, said Sir Ralph and Nicholas, and I will see what my heart filled, said Norwell, for any wrong you have done me, I now freely and fully forgive you, and may heaven in its infinite mercy forgive you likewise. Amen, ejaculated the monarch, and all the others joined in the ejaculation. The king then moved to the door, which was opened for him by the two Ashtons. At the foot of the steps stood Master Potts, attended by an officer of the guard and a party of halberdiers. In the midst of them, their hands tied behind their backs were Jem Device, his mother Janet, and poor Nance Redburn. Jem looked odd and sullen. Elizabeth downcast, but Janet maintained her accustomed malignant expression. Poor Nance was the only one who excited any sympathy. Janet's malice seemed now directed against Master Potts, whom she charged with having betrayed and deceived her. If Tib had not deserted me, he should tear thee in pieces. Thou ill favoured little monster, she cried. Monster in your own face, you hideous little wrench, exclaimed the indignant attorney. If you use such opprobrious epithets, I will have you gagged. You will be taken to a Lancaster castle and hanged. You are as bad as I am and worse, replied Janet, and deserve hanging as well. And the king shan know of your tricks, she vociferated as James appeared at the door of the pavilion. Your wish to ensnare Alison, your wish me to kill her. I was only your instrument. Stop her mouth, gag her, cried Potts. Nah, nah, they shanna stop my mouth. They shanna gag me, cried Janet. I will speak out, the king shall hear me. You are as bad as me. Oh, malice, your majesty. Oh, malice, cried the attorney. Malice, no doubt, in great part, replied James. But some truth as well, I fear, sir, and in any case, it prevent my doing anything for you. There you have ruined my horse, you little wrench, cried Potts furiously. I'm right glad of it, said Janet. You may take me to Lancaster Castle, but you canna hang me. I know that full well. I shan't get out and then look to yourself, lad, for as sure as I'm Mother Dendy's granddaughter, I'm plague the life out of you. Take the prisoners away and let them be conveyed under a strict escort to Lancaster Castle, said James. And as the assizes commence next week, quick work will be made with them, your majesty, observed Potts. Their guilt can be incontestably proved, so they are sure to be found guilty, sure to be hanged, sire. As the prisoners were removed, Nance Redburn looked round her, and catching the eye of Nicholas made a slight motion with her head as if bidding them farewell. The squire returned the mutilation. Poor Nancy exclaimed compassionately. I sincerely pity her. But there was any means of saving her. There is none, observed Sir Ralph Ashton. And you may be thankful you are not brought in as her accomplice. As Janet was taken away, she continued to hurl threats and imprecations against Potts. Another officer of guard was then summoned, and when he came, James said, One other prisoner remains within the pavilion. She likewise must be conveyed to Lancaster Castle, but in a litter and not with the other prisoners. Attended by Sir Richard Horton, the monarch then proceeded to his lodgings in the tower. One grave, not withstanding the sad occurrences before detail, James remained for two more days the guest of Sir Richard Ford, enjoying his princely hospitality, hunting in the park, arousing great hall, witnessing all kinds of sport. Nothing indeed was left to remind him of the sad events that had occurred. The prisoners were taken that night to Lancaster Castle, and Master Potts accompanied the escort to be ready for the assizes. Three judges proceeded thither at the end of the week. The attendants of Roger Norwell, Nicholas, and Sir Ralph Ashton was also required as witnesses at the trial of which Sir Richard Ashton and Dorothy had returned, as already stated, to Middleton, and though the intelligence of the death of Richard and Alison was communicated to them with even a caution, the shock for both was very great, especially to Dorothy, who was long, very long in recovery from it. Nicholas's vivacity of temperament made him feel the loss of his cousin at first very keenly, but it soon wore off. Vowed amendment and reformation on the model of John Brown, whose life offers so striking a contrast to his own that it has very probably been placed in opposition by a reverend moralist, but I regret to say that he did not carry out his praiseworthy intention. He was apt to make joke of John Brown instead of imitating in his example, he professed to devote himself to his excellent wife, but his old habits would break out. And I am sorry to say he was often to be found in the alehouse and was just as fond of horse racing, cock fighting, hunting, fishing, and all other sorts as ever. Occasionally he occupied a leisure or a rainy day with a journal, parts of which have been preserved, but he set down in a few of the terrible events he had related, probably because they were of too painful a nature to be recorded. He died in 1625 at the early age of 35, but to go back a few days after the tragical events of Orton Tower, the whole village of Wally was a but it was 
was no festive occasion, no merry making that called for the inhabitants to be sat on every counter to day two was gloomy. The feathered summits of warning that were reading mist, and a fine rain descended in the valley, called a dull and discoloured as it blowed past the walls of the ancient abbey. The church bell tolled mournfully, and a large concourse was gathered in the churchyard, not far from one of the three crosses of holiness which stood nearest the church porch. A grave had been digged, and almost everyone looked into it. The grave, it was said, was intended to hold two coffins. Soon after this, a train of mourners issued from the ancient abbey gate house, and sure enough, there were two coffins on the shoulders of bearers. They were met at the gate by Dr. Ormerod, who was so deeply affected as scarcely to be able to warn the needful officers for the dead. The principal mourners were Sir Richard Asherton of Middleton, Sir Ralph Asherton, and Nicholas. Amid the tears and sobs of all the bystanders, the bodies of Richard and Alison were committed to the earth, laid together in one grave. Thus was their latest wish fulfilled. Flowers grew upon the turf that covered them, and there was the earliest primrose seen, and the latest violet. Many a fond youth and trusted maiden had visited their lowly tomb, and many a tear, fresh from the heart, had dropped on us, sodering the ill days of Lancaster Castle. Behold the grim and giant fabric rebuilt, and served by old John Ogle, time on the Lancaster. Within one of its turrets, called John Ogle's chair, and that even tired stands a lady under the care of a gaola. It is the last sunset she will ever see, the last time she will look upon the beauties of her, for she is a prisoner, condemned to die, an ignominious and terrible death, and her execution will take place on the morrow. Leaving her alone within the turret, the gaola locks the door and stands outside it. The lady casts a long, lingering look around. Old nature seems so beautiful, so attractive. The sunset upon the broad watery sands of Walker Bay is exquisite in variety. Bells of earnest, little and old, and the windings of the loom are clearly traced out. She casts a wistful glance towards the mountainous reaches of Lancashire, and fancies she can detect amongst the heights around the summit of Hill Hill. Then the gaze settles upon the grey old town beneath her, and as the glance wanders over it, certain terrible objects are resting in the area before the castle. She sees a ring of tall and safe. She knows well their purpose and counts them. They are thirteen in number. Thirteen wretched beings are heard on the morrow. Not far from the stage is an enormous pile of faggots, all is prepared, fascinated by the sight she remains gazing at this execution was time, and when she turns she holds tall, dark man standing beside her. At first she thinks it is a gaola, and is about to tell the man she is ready to descend to herself, when she recognises him and recoils in terror. Thou, here again stride, I can save thee from the stake thou wilt, Alice not, he said. Hence, she exclaimed, thou tempest me in vain, hence, and with a howl of rage, the demon disappeared, conveyed back to the cell, situated within the red dungeon tower. Alice Nutter has set all of that night in prayer towards four o'clock. Wearied out, she dropped into a slumber, and when the clergyman on whom she had received spiritual consolation came to her cell, he found her still sleeping, but with a sweet smile on her lips. The first he had ever beheld there, unwilling to disturb her, he knelt down and prayed by her side. At length, the gaola came, and the executioner's aides, the divine then laid his hand on her shoulder, and she instantly arose. I am ready, she said here, you have had a happy dream, daughter, you observe. Blessed dream, reverend sir, she replied. I thought I saw my children, Richard and Alison, in the fair garden. Oh, how angelic they were, and they told me I should be with them soon. And I doubt not the wisdom will be realized, replied the clergyman. Your redemption is fully worked out, and your salvation, I trust you. And now you must prepare for your last trial. And full of prayer, she replied, will you not go to the earth? Alas, my dear daughter, he replied, they all, except in that's red refuse my services, and will perish in their iniquities. Then go to her, sir, I entreat of you, she said. She may yet be saved, but what janet is she to die? No, replied the divine being. Evidence against her relatives, her life is said. Heaven grant she do no more mischief, exclaimed the mistress to her. She then submitted herself to the executioner's assistance and was led forth. On issuing into the open air, a change came over her, and such an exceeding vainness that she had to be supported. She was led toward the state in this state, but she grew fainter and fainter, and at last fell back in the arms of the men that supported her. Still, they carried her on. When the executioner put out his hand to receive her from his aid, she was found to be quite dead. Nevertheless, he tied her to the stake, and her body was consumed. Hundreds of spectators beheld those terrible fires and exulted in the torments of miserable sufferers. Their shrieks and blasphemies were terrific, and the place resembled a hell upon her. Janet escaped to dismay of Master Parts, who feared she would wreak her threatened vengeance upon him, and indeed he did not soil the aches and ramps when he attributed to her, but which were more reasonably thought to be owing to Ray of course in the marshes of Hendel Forest. He had, however, the pleasure of assisting at her execution when some years afterwards retributive justice overtook her. Janet was the last of the Lancashire witches ever since then, which has taken a new form with the ladies of the county. Though their fascination and cells are as important as ever, few can now escape them, few desire to do so. But to all who are afraid of a bright eye and a blooming cheek, and who desire to adhere to a bachelor's condition, to such I should say, beware of the Lancashire witches.